Hi, I'm Dirk Tidi, creator of Paradigm Shift. If you'd like to check out my work, it's at paradigmshiftmanga.com. You're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a returning guest. Now, I say a returning guest only because of two, two issues that occurred. One, I recorded his interview back in 2012 at one of the very first C2E2 comic conventions in Chicago, which is still an amazing convention. The issue was... My sound guy didn't record the audio, so it is a null and void interview. So 10 plus years later, he is back on the show and we are joined by the ever talented creator of Paradigm Shift, of course, Dirk Tidy. Hey. How are you doing today? Thank you. Thank you. And, oh, just by the way, it is TD. Thank you. I never, ever expect anyone to get that right. <laughs> Dirk TD joins the interview here yes. today. <laughs> how are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm I'm excited to be here. I'm thank you so much for inviting me to come. Oh, no, thank thanks for coming by. I know your work fairly well because I've been following you for a long time. I've seen your evolution of your your comic style and your evolution to a brand new venture, of course, with an animated series. I'm jumping ahead of myself though. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. Absolutely. So I'm Dirk Titi, and I'm primarily known as a comic creator. Uh, I'm known for uh, this series, comic series, Paradigm Shift. It is a werewolf detective story. Got a, two massive volumes out of it. Uh, it's sort of been a labor of love for the last 20 years. And uh, I'm now currently working on the first short animated film based on the series. We're going to get into talking about all that this hour, and that's why I'm here. You know, when I first saw your your comic series and back at C2E2, and I had followed you online as well, too, because I had a list of over 4,000 webcom creators back in the early, late 90s, early 2000s, because that's how many there were, if not tens of thousands more. But you've survived for 20 years. That's an amazing accomplishment in itself. You've you stood the test of time with an amazing series with Paradigm Shift as well, too. You were right next to, uh, of course, uh, Iron Circus Comics uh, at, at C2E2 back then. So Spike has yes. been doing incredible work with her own works as well, too. Talk it's about, <laughs> I know, it's like 20, <laughs> 20 years and uh, you guys are still around, which is incredible to see. And from your journey when you first started, your webcomic to now, what has changed from your creative perspective and maybe the business itself? Oh my God. I mean, when I first started, it was the late nineties. So, I mean, I first wrote the outline of what became paradigm shift in like 1998. So at the time I'd seen like one or two other comics online, but there was no word for web comics. When I started, I just, I knew how to make comics and I knew how to make websites. So I made a website and I put my comic on it. I hoped at some day to print a book. I hoped, you know, or get picked up by a publisher or something. I just started putting it online because it was a place I could put it. I mean, over the course of starting that series, going into like what became the webcomics movement in the early aughts, joining Modern Tales, which was the first subscription based comic site, like with creators like Gene Yang, who now has American Born Chinese on Disney Plus. I mean, uh, or Raina Telgemeier, whose Smile series oh, yeah. has been like just a perennial bestseller forever at this point. I mean, rubbing shoulders with people like that. And Spike, I mean, Spike and I were convention buddies for like five years. I mean, we we exhibited at uh, San Diego Comic-Con several years in a row together. We just went in on a small press table together and now she's got Iron Circus Comics and it's like, she's like the lackadaisy uh, pilot that just came out and just like, oh, uh, she just continuously blows my mind that how far she's come with all that. And okay. as I've just kind of keep coming back to working on my stuff as I can. That's awesome. Yeah. 20 years is a long time in the industry, especially in, in comics itself here too. You've evolved since then as well. You've transitioned into animation and of course this short film, which I definitely want to talk about happened upon, I've been following you on, on Twitter and social media for a while as well too. So when I first saw your initial concepts of this amazing animation, I was like, wow, this is just incredible. Like, how did this come about and why did this come about and what are you using? Like, let's dive right into it. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. So the reason it came about was I was over the pandemic. I, well, in 20, 
just to really groundwork in 2019, 2020, I did a Kickstarter uh, that collected like the 20 years of material for Paradigm Shift. And I had such a overwhelming response to it. I was like, well, clearly people people like it. And I I would love to finish the story. So over the then the pandemic hit and I had already started writing the script for the next storyline. And so it took about a year. I got like the, this massive tome. It's like a 500 page script. And I realized, oh, my God, this is like at least two books or possibly an entire series. And so I into 2021, I started working on the uh, the first issue. Uh, I was thinking, okay, well, I'll, I'll break it into issues, release it as issues, and maybe publish it on the web after the fact once I get it out. Long story short, I crashed and burned on that first issue. I got ran into total writer's block during the uh, the editing process. Just over a year ago, I decided I'd just put it down. It, it occurred to me long ago when I first started the series that I would love to see it animated. I've always wanted to see it animated. I mean, half the reason I was like pushing into the comics industry was hoping that maybe it would get get some attention and maybe somebody would want to turn it into a series uh, because I, I love movies. I love TV. It's half the, half the reason I do comics is because it's easy to do by yourself. You don't have to have a giant team and whatnot. But fast forward 20 years, like suddenly the hardware is there the software is there i put this issue down and was like i'm gonna just start i've wanted to do like a 3d transformation of kate my werewolf character since the very beginning i dabbled with this software called daz 3d studio um on and off just to like as a virtual character reference or just you know to poke around and so i kind of knew how the basics of character stuff worked and i was like i want to learn blender all right well let's see if i can like take one of these free models and modify it. And so like it became like a little side project about April last year. And fast forward about about four weeks, I had a completely transformable version of Kate in this uh, version of Daz Studio. And I'd sort of learned Blender. I'd taken like a, a tutorial thing like the summer before. It never really, like, so I had the basics of the program and I had done 3D stuff like way back in the day, but yeah. It, it's been sort of a an extra tool that I can use, but it wasn't my primary thing. So I sort of like sat down and like just I was I I was just totally obsessed with it. <laughs> just like learn how to like export models out of Daz and bring them into Blender and then modify them, push all the points around and then import the figures back into Daz. So then I had like a little morph. So I had like the werewolf version and the human version. I could just do a little slider and it would transform. And go, whoop. And I was like, oh, this is awesome. And I was like, wow, what, what if I could? Like, but it was like realistic looking, you know, Daz defaults to sort of photo real. And I was like, well, this kind of looks like Horizon Zero Dawn or Tomb Raider or one of those. That's kind of cool. But could I make it anime? Could I make it look like my comic characters? And so uh, that was the next thing. I was like, OK, can I? So I brought that in. I started mushing around and. Next thing I know, within a week, I had like a like an anime looking version of Kate and changed all the shaders. So it would look like cell shading. I started playing around with it, figure out how to do the lines, do the outlines uh, using a, a, a piece of software in Blender called Freestyle. Um, and I was like, huh, well, let's see if I can do the werewolf transformation. And so I spent a couple of weeks and did these tests, to, and which I posted on Twitter a couple of weeks ago. They're out in the world now, but... It, after I got that done and that this whole process from the beginning to having like this fully transformable model that l looked animated, you know, looked hand animated, took about two months and it was about eight weeks wow. or so. Um, I was building off of skills that I already had, but I, I love the technical side of creativity too. Like I've always been kind of a computer guy is on top of being an illustrator and artist. And once I had that, I was like, I got to do something with this. So my initial thought was, well, maybe I'll make a little music video and I'll do the transformation sequence and it'll be about two minutes long and that'll be awesome. Like That would just be fun. And so I like made some sets and did some tests and about July, I started work on what became the film. And what happened was I just got so into it that it just, I kept having more ideas. So the next thing I know, I just started another scene and start animating it. And it was sort of like, 
using sections of the comic as storyboarding it, but then I'd come up with some new stuff to kind of tie things together wow. so I could kind of put it together into the sequence. And by November, like I had 15, I had 15 scenes <laughs> like, and, and, and it come uh, by the mid December, I got the whole first rough of the whole thing done. And I, a friend of mine, uh, Alexander Danner, who is a uh, lo local Boston comics writer who now does podcasts. He's has this long running story podcast called greater Boston, okay. which my wife and actually, and I do actually do music for, uh actually they, he brought us into like a recording studio last summer and like we got to like record like in a real music studio it was amazing anyway i got to talking with him at mice which is the big independent comic show up here and uh, i was like yeah i'm working on this animated film you know i'd love to talk to you about sound and he was like well you know i'm doing a class on doing sound for film right now and i need something for my final project i was like well, tell you what, I'll just send you what I got and see what you can do with it. And then in December, I was just finishing up the like the last scenes that I'd created. And I get this email with like basically three quarters of my film with sound in it, including a friend who like does the voice of Kate as she's transforming. Oh, wow. And I was like, oh, this is amazing. So that I using that, I like quick brought it all into Premiere and like put all the scenes in and brought a couple of music tracks that I had, I had made like a year before that I knew I wanted to use that were going to be the basis of the music video. Um, wow. edited, and so like about December 15th, I had the whole rough cut of the film and it's seven minutes long. It's like <laughs> over seven minutes of like, material. It's like, I have a movie. <laughs> it's not ready, but it's the mm. rough, the rough is there. And so I've basically since January, I've been going back through each each scene and cleaning it up. And I just finished the second to last scene. Oh, wow. So I will be done in about two weeks with the, <laughs> all the visuals. And then I got to go back, go back through and do the sound pass. Mm -hmm. So I'm meeting with the owner of a local brew pub uh, this week. And we're going to nail down a time and date for the uh, the premiere. And I'm going to premiere it at the local brew pub because he's got a screen and a sound system. And I know him because I, I mean, I was actually just there this morning playing music yeah wow. we're gonna do a little premiere and it's gonna be awesome and then i'm gonna start submitting it to film festivals and talking to conventions and things about wow. maybe showings around the overall time of your short film is what is it seven minutes in total yeah, it's about seven it's about seven and a half minutes or so hey. minus minus the uh, credits <laughs> for a short film that is respectable because it's usually five to 30 minutes for a, a short so i mean you're set in a great time frame that you can easily hit those short film festivals no problem like it so that's what i do as well too i produce and i do all that stuff on the side uh, compared to this but it's just amazing you're taking an amazing comic you're putting in an animation I, i'm thinking back to things like scott christian sava's um dreamland chronicles I'm, I'm thinking back to pan harrison's you know uh, house of muses uh, you know i'm looking back at all these old web comics that utilize 3d anime or 3d models and things like that and now we see paradigm shift now in, in animated form. Like, why not just lock it in and go the lackadaisy route and go a two hour or an hour and 20 minute uh, feature? Well, I have ideas. <laughs> I definitely have ideas. I would definitely have to go. This I've managed to do all by myself aside from the sound production. Um, to do anything more would require a team, but I think that might be doable. Once the film's done, I'm going to start experimenting. There's a local art school I've been uh -huh. uh, working with lately and getting to know some of the animation students. And so I'm going to be definitely setting up internships in the fall, possibly working with some of the recent grads on doing some like freelance work to see if I can work together on projects. Cause I would love to do a pilot kind of like the lackadaisy thing. Yeah. Even if I could get a small team of like 10 people, I think it would be very doable. Yeah. It must be a matter of like the organization part that I have to become a director. <laughs> so I'm used to working entirely by myself, but I think this is something I could definitely see how the little pieces could be farmed out to like, you know, somebody who specializes in modeling, somebody yeah. set, specializes in character rigging, someone who specializes in modeling for like backgrounds, somebody who specializes in compositing, mm -hmm. obviously sound, that sort of thing. Like 
each of these are separate jobs. I'm wearing all the hats right now, but it would be very easy to be able to like, as long as I found some people I could work with to like pass things off. And then my main skill set as a generalist would be as the director. I can envision it in a way that I've never been able to envision trying to like make a team out of doing my comics. It just doesn't really, that doesn't work. The fact that you've already you've done everything solo for twenty years, I'm sure it's it's difficult to let go of certain aspects and certain things. Yeah. On the other hand, if you find talented people who do like who are better at the thing than you are, <laughs> <laughs> then have at it. Yes. I, I might I might be able to I might be able to try things out of my hands a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm with you on that. I completely understand. The flexibility of, of learning new software is is interesting because it's about time management and it's about allotting your energy into, say, learning like Blender or uh, that other software you mentioned, etc. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking back to 3D Studio Max when I used to do like architectural design and things like that back in the day as well, too. But what is it about, about Blender that just made your process more complete or how did you find the software when you were first working there? I'm kind of curious from well, a beginner to your current uh, expertise status. Well, when I first started to play with it, um, I was looking for alternatives to SketchUp because uh, I've used SketchUp for like 15 years at this point, but it's now paid. Mm -hmm. It's not free anymore. Um, so I've been paying like the annual fee for it, which is, you know, eh, 300 bucks, you know, it's not cheap, but it's not, overly expensive either i always have thought in 3d i've used 3d packages going back to the mid 90s so even things in ps i build sets in 3d and use them to help uh speed up the background work mm -hmm. these days like for at least since the end of part three like I've, I've basically been using 3d models to like speed up that process and i was like hmm, blender it has been around forever uh it's free. Uh, it can do a lot. I'd love to learn a little more about it. Plus, I was over the pandemic. I was playing a ton of video games. Like I like had not played anything in like ten years, and I came back and like put Windows on my iMac and was like playing the Tomb Raider re reboots yeah. and going like, wow. yeah, like oh my god, like video games got really good while I was oh, while I was away. It's like suddenly oh they have like decent stories now and like Horizon Zero Dawn just completely. Oh blew my mind it's just like holy crap what a great game like so i was like ah, it's kind of fun to play with some 3d stuff again um so i did like a, a tutorial from a guy blender guru on tube it was like a 20 part series something i just made a chair that's all i did i modeled a chair but it taught me the basics of how the software worked um you know the difference between the different modes and how, how you basically move stuff around in it and so i had sort of a basic understanding of how blender worked just i mean that was like two days out of my summer a like year and a half ago at this point i do like learning new software i like learning especially when i have a project but yeah for this it's because i had the project i learned the software to do the project did tutorials when i ran into a stumbling block like okay i'm working i'm working i'm working uh how do i do this okay over to youtube blah 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 do a quick tutorial. Oh, okay. That's how it works. Go back, continue on in project. Like basically that's how I've worked for the past year. It's like, I haven't been doing as much jumping into YouTube since the, since 2023 hit, because I've just, I know more or less what I need at this point. Now it's just refinement. Although I did take a break in December and signed up for Blender Studio, which is their uh, animation, like, Blender, the Blender Institute has an animation studio attached to it, and they put out a short film every year, and they share all the assets, they share, like, tutorials, they, like, so I, I, it's like a paid thing, but it's like 10 bucks a month to access all that stuff, and I was like, oh yeah, hell, that, hell yes, and so I signed up for that and did a bunch of tutorials on that and learned a ton about, like, some of the more nitty gritty details about things like actual animation doing walk cycles doing like timing stuff that was just sort of winging for for the whole first draft of the film just using my sense of timing i mean also musicians so i have a i do have a sense of time 
uh, and and my even the comics when I'm writing the scripts, it's like a movie that plays in my head. They the characters move around. They they move around. They talk. It's all in my mind's eye. So in some ways, doing the animation once I had the figures all rigged up, I could just move them around and have them do what I want in a way that is pretty efficient. And then I have to go back and clean it up. But so basically, I just use a project to learn any new tool. It's always been that way. And then I just use my research <laughs> to like help me when I run into a problem. How do I problem solve it? You know, Google is your friend. <laughs> but it's it's good that you're using your time efficiently to to do what you need. It's not like you're trying to do like a video game or something like that based off of, although technically you got actually. I mean, it'd be awesome, it. but no, like, <laughs> that that is definitely something that would require a team. Right. Then how has music informed your creativity in terms of not only the comic, but of course, with your short film? Music is sort of my hobby. Um, it's the it's my outlet that it's a creative outlet that doesn't isn't attached to my career. It's something that has no stakes attached to it. It's just fun. I mean, obviously, there's elements of, you know, I have like soundtracks or things that I'll listen to while I'm while I'm creating. And, and I have sort of a, a, a tonal sense of what like if there were was a soundtrack to a particular scene or whatnot, like I have a sense of like, oh yeah, this would be some like Nine Inch Nails style industrial thing here with the werewolf mm. action. Like I know what that would sound like, but they've kind of been separate up until now. And then with the film is the first time I've been able to bring these two things together where I have my stories and then I have my music and I can actually put them together into a, a thing. There was some creative time in the last decade where I was looking to do other outlets other than comics. And I started painting, for instance, yep. and then uh, I decided to like really dig into doing guitar. And then I started recording, recording things. And I was like, I would love to have a real bass. And so then I started playing bass and like it, it's just a hobby. It's just a thing that it's, I mean, I call them my joy machines. They're, there's. They're just things that make me happy. And also, like I said, I had a gig this morning. I, I play Irish and Scottish music on fiddle. So mm -hmm. um, we we had a we we host an my wife and I host an Irish session. We were we were hosting a brunch like that we do twice a month. So oh, nice. So yeah. So it's it's more like the music is sort of a separate thing, but it it feeds a different part of my creative soul. I've always done both drawing and music since I was a kid. I've always done both. Everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most bullshit piece of advice you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received mm -hmm. that has stuck with you in your varying careers? And you can have it for either animation, uh, comics, or whatever you'd like. Oh, that is an interesting question. I can tell you all sorts of bad advice that I've gotten. <laughs> you, you, sort of things I've had to de I've had to deprogram myself from. I mean I think paying attention to how I feel while I'm doing something like it's something that I've had to like find my way into. And then I didn't like, I think like you often hear follow your bliss, but I think if you take that at its literal sense, it's not actually that useful because that can re lead you down false paths. Cause there are plenty of times when you're, you're doing the work and the work does not feel good. Uh, or there's a grind or whatnot. And, but that doesn't mean it's not worthwhile. On the other hand, there's an underlayer to that, which is pay attention to how you're feeling over the course of a thing. And I do find when I'm, there's like that little voice that's, oh man, that would be really cool. And if I listen to it, every time I've done that, that has definitely led me to, to good things, even though there are times where I'm like, like right now I'm, I'm in the grind part of, or as one of my coaches, uh, Jessica Abel, uh, says, I'm in the Kyber Pass part of the project, which is sort of just it's that grind that you do to get to the end. And it's not to say that there aren't fun parts, because there certainly are fun parts. But when I have to like re-render the current shot that I'm on for the third time, because I found something in the compositing process where I'm like, I, I clean that up. That's that's no good. Like yesterday, I spent all day working on one shot. And mm. I just like, I mean, it, it is the final shot of the film, but so it needs to look good. But yeah, I was going back through and re, like, like 
fixing all these little tiny details and it's like i can kind of zen out on the work like that but it's not the fun part but like the real fun part is the animated the animating part that's the really fun part where a character initially comes to life so it's like the follow your bliss but then there's like the it doesn't always work out that way but at the same time like i have the feeling of working on the animation as a thing right now and it is joyful it is really joyful even if like i am so sick of this shot right now i'm so ready to have it be done and then it's done i'm like all right i get to work on the next thing and that's why i've put out these little goofy uh parody videos the last couple of weeks yeah. i've I'm sort of in the grind part of doing the film. So I've like taken a few days and just done a stupid little, oh, here's a little parody of Sailor Moon's <laughs> magical girl transformation as a werewolf because I needed to just do something fun for, for a little, even though it was just a, a but, just a thing. <laughs> but it, it's a great, it's a great break though. Like you, like you said, you can exactly. Yeah, you, you need to, you can't just focus on it 12 hours a day and then just sleep and then get back into it. It's just exactly not exactly. not healthy creatively and, and bodily either. <laughs> what was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Hmm. Oh, wow. These are deep questions. <laughs> uh, well, I can give sort of the negative example uh, of that, where you internalize a piece of basically bad advice or or negative self-talk although it's interesting so i had a professor you know when i was in college and i went to art school and i got a degree in commercial art and and there was a a guy uh who was like the long time professor he taught painting and whatnot uh, and i remember him doing a we were doing a not a portfolio review but we were like doing a it was my junior year and we were looking at my body of work and I remember him like flipping through these drawings and I was so burnt out. Now, if I look back and at the time I was realizing, Hey, this is going through a period where I was kind of depressed, but he was like, yeah, your work is weak and uninspired. And wow, did that bounce around in my head for nearly 20 years. And so like, that's like a piece of negative self-talk that, it took me a long time to realize like, oh, I can trace that back to like one guy. I mean, he obviously was a, a an important figure in my college experience because he was sort of in charge of, you know, part of my evaluation. But like, like, wow, one of those cases where like you can put way too much weight on just a single phrase that somebody says, somebody who's important to you says, and you have to like, be able to take a step back and go like, oh, wait, I keep hearing that in my head. That's something this guy said. Well, why, why, why do I believe that? Hmm. And doing that process is what helps you unwind from it and then not place so much meaning on it anymore. And then it just becomes like, oh, yeah, it's that guy again. <laughs> yeah, you can shut up, Marv. <laughs> Good time. Yeah. It's it's weird. I, like I'm now starting to work with students, and so now I'm I'm very cognizant about what I say to to them, and I try to be encouraging. At the same time, I also want to like be realistic. I want to make sure that I'm giving them good good advice, but I also know that those moments where that that helped carry me through was when somebody who was important to me at the time said something, you know, very not just complimentary but meaningfully like encouraging you know that those those were the things that helped buoy me through those moments where things were not great we're informed by the people that have mentored us and who have taught us and and we've learned from our own personal experiences as well too so it's not like well that's it is an open-ended question it is something along the lines of everyone answers it differently so your example for for that instance many have said something similar as well too others have thought back to a parental figure that haven't have been that guiding posts, et cetera. You know, there, there are a variety of different ways you can, you can approach it. But as long as you can work through it and find your own resolution, that's the ultimate end goal, truly, no matter yeah. how it all started. Absolutely. It seems like once you get past, like, here I am, I'm in my late forties and I've been doing, doing this for over 20 years and realizing that like the last 10 years I've, I've picked up all sorts of new skills or built on skills that I had that, you know, got put in a freezer and 
resuscitated. And somewhere along the line, I had to realize like, oh, the stuff that I, it's not my skills that are holding me back here. It's totally like my, my, my headspace, my mind space, like where am I at? That that's the sort of thing that, and so that's become the new game. Like, how do I, how do I get around that? And so like the animation is sort of a result of that realizing, oh yeah, I, this feels good and i'm excited about this and i think i need to keep exploring that small victories that's what well, that's all we can hope for in life you know exactly. look back at what we've vict- what we've done and, and go from there and that's that's a great way i like that is there a comic or piece of animation either manga or anime or cartoons that made you feel the way you hope people see this new animated work of paradigm shift feel oh wow I mean, there's a several ones that I can think of, but like, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> while I could hope to give the impression that the Akira had on me the first time I saw it, <laughs> I mean, given that was like, I was a senior in high school and watching it in a friend's kitchen and it was totally like a, like a dub of a dub of a dub, yep. <laughs> totally bootleg copy. But I remember like just that completely blowing my mind and like going like, wow, you can make cartoons like this. I mean, obviously, that was made from a giant team of really, really professional yeah. people, and I, I can't say that my my work that I've done in the last year rises to that level yet. But I can aspire. <laughs> I can aspire. But I, I mean, I hope that I hope that somebody who watches this and sees that sees the transformation, the werewolf transformation that I was the whole reason I did the whole thing in the first place. Like they go, like, holy crap, that was awesome. That was really cool. Like. I would love to have the effect that watching Akira for the first time or watching the Ghost in the Shell movie or, I mean, one day I would like to be able to rise to the level of Hayao Miyazaki and having, you know, bringing somebody to tears. But right now I will I will just, I will settle for like, wow, that was really cool. <laughs> well, I'm going to say it. Your, that werewolf transformation wasn't just cool. It was fucking awesome. I loved it. Cool. And that's just like, that's, that's small slices. I mean, yeah, that's, I have not shown at all. <laughs> Before I jump into my last uh, four questions, fifth one is a fun one. Is there anything that I've missed you'd like to showcase those that are watching and listening to this oh. interview? For those of you who have never read Paradigm Shift before, please go check it out. You can read it at paradigmshiftmanga.com. I've got the whole story up there for now. Um, I still have people like go, oh, hey, is there going to be more? Maybe eventually. Uh, right now I'm working on a movie. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it, please go check it out. It's a werewolf detective story. And it's like a buddy cop thing that meets the X-Files and in this like lovingly recreated manga form. <laughs> so I hope you check it out. And then my movie will be out this summer. I'm looking at the end of June. It will be coming out soon. It'll be on my YouTube channel, DT Comics. I used to do two hour webcomic interviews actually when I first started back in 2008. Wow. I did I did one like that a couple of weeks ago with uh, an old friend from Modern Tales who just oh, nice. does live streams and like we went on for like two and a half hours. It was kind of awesome. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Th- those are good friends to have. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who is that for you? I would have to say my mentor in college. His name was Alan Thursby, and he uh, ran a video production company uh, in the town where I was going to school in Decatur, Illinois. I was going to Millican University, and uh, a friend of mine at school said, Hey, uh, I know this guy through my synagogue. He's looking for an intern. You know, I thought of you, you know, why don't you give him a call? And I did. And he was so warm and kind. And he, he welcomed me into what he was doing. He had this whole video production set up in a, a small office. And he basically just turned me loose with all the stuff. Like, I mean, this was like 1995, I want to say. And he had a whole like nonlinear video editor set up with a like a you know maxed out Mac and it was hooked up to this whole video editing suite and 
I'd never seen full res video playing on a computer before. It was like, oh my God. And then he turned me loose with like Adobe. It wasn't even Adobe After Effects. It was like After Effects version one. And he just like, let me learn all this stuff. And then the next thing I know, I was like doing graphics for like industrial videos. They weren't, they weren't exciting, but the fact that I could do like this animation stuff and actually it was going out in the world and doing something was really, really inspiring. And he really built up my confidence in a way that I, I would not have had otherwise. Like he was appreciative of what I did. He, he, he was hands off in a way that let me like learn new things in the style I needed to learn, but he was also like helpful and give guidance and then just welcomed me into his world and just, you know, he didn't talk down to me. He would just let me do what I was doing in a in a way that helped him. I don't think that I would have gotten through my young adult experience is coming away as confident and with a sense that I I could do that. that I could do the things that I wanted to do uh, if I hadn't had that experience. He went on to like hire me for the summer part time, and then I ended up working for him all the way through. Uh, the rest of my school time at school. And it was just an amazing experience. I don't think I would be the same person if I hadn't had that. From a professional standpoint, you have been in the comic industry for over 20 years, creating uh, the amazing paradigm shift as well, too. And the fact that you now have a very, a very amazing and incredible short film is amazing to see as well. So congratulations on both of those amazing accomplishments. Professionally, you're successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? You know, that's a that's a good question. I think if you had asked me that five years ago, I would have said no. But now I realize like I have the best gift that I could ask for, which is I have time to work on whatever I want. And while Paradigm Shift may not have gotten like any awards or picked up by a major publisher or anything, like I completed I I published six books at this point. I mean, given their you know, one's one's a compilation, but I mean, I've self-published a bunch of books. I'm now working on a short film and my time is my own. And while the comic itself has never made tons of money, it's always paid for itself. When I really think about that objectively, I have to say, yeah, I mean, if I had was just getting out of school, like say the mentee I'm going to be working with this summer and looked at myself, I would be like, oh my God, I wish I could do that. I I could be that guy. But five years ago, I don't think I was in that spot. I don't think I would have like realized, I don't think I would have had the perspective to realize like, oh, wow, I've, I've done, I've managed to get to this point. Now, obviously there's, I've had plenty of help along the way. It is not, this was not a case of me going, and look, I pulled myself up by my bootstraps. I mean, I wouldn't be able to do this without my wife. I wouldn't be able to do this without my friends, my family. I mean, obviously my readers. In the end, like, what else could you ask for as a creative than to be able to, like, work on the projects you want to, have them pay for themselves, not be, like, burdened down by a lot of debt, and have a nice life? How is that not success? You're still alive. That's the main thing, too. So Alive and healthy. And, yeah. you know, now I'm going to the gym. The pandemic kind of uh, put the boot in my butt to <laughs> go and start getting in shape. <laughs> yeah, we're not getting any younger, that's for sure. <laughs> oh, I, I can see... I just turned 48, so oh. I can see I can see 50 coming up over the horizon and going, you know what? I want to make sure that I'm as in good a shape as I can be as I go into my 50s. <laughs> the reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Well, I mean, it depends on the failure. Um, there are times where it has felt like 2013, I, I was in a bad spot and I, I kind of curled up and I disappeared for a while. And for me, when things are not going well, that's usually when I turn off the social media and I kind of go do something else for a while. But at the same time, the other way of dealing with failure, I mean, sometimes you just need a break. And then the other other times it's just pick yourself up, dust yourself off and try again. Like I've had to do a lot of that kind of thing over the course of working on the film. Well, I'll, I'll just, I'll run into some problem and I'm like, uh, what's going like that totally didn't work. How am I going to fix that? And in which case, like I just redouble my efforts. I try something different. There's no really one 
answer to like dealing with failure. I think in the end, I guess if I had to boil it down to one thing, I'd say be kind to yourself because everybody fails. And in fact, failure is where learning comes from. Like if you if you sailed through life getting everything right the first time around, you might not actually know what it, it was that you did in order to, to, to pull off what you've, you've done. Um, and sometimes I think failure is the way that we actually learn the best lessons, even in times where I felt like, oh, I'm this isn't working. I don't know if I'm ever going to do comics again or whatnot. That really ended up being an opportunity to try some other things, in which case 2013, that's kind of when I started playing music again, like more seriously. I also that led to me learning how to paint and trying a bunch of other stuff. So when I actually did come back to comics, I had a lot more to bring to it and I was inspired again. At the time it felt like a failure, but it turned out to just be an opportunity. And in some ways, like last year when I fell down on working on what was going to become a new issue one, that ended up being an opportunity to play around with the 3D stuff and animation, which has now led to doing a short film. So things that look like failures turn out to not be failures. They just turn out to be opportunities for trying something else. The younger generation is looking at your work and then becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a comic writer or an animation individual or something along that creative line. Maybe you've inspired them in some way, shape or form. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Well, I do like the idea of paying forward. I mean, for me, what I like to always do is share the sort of stuff that I wish somebody had told me. I'm always willing to share about process. I'm welcoming of students to like come in and visit my studio or go. I, I went to a high school on Thursday to just to go bring my work and share. I just think being open and sharing what you're doing at any point along your path. When I was just doing comics for a couple of years, I started doing this sort of thing. So it's just uh, where, where I go and share to students. I think just be encouraging, share what you're doing. I absolutely don't think of generations coming up behind me as being competition. I think them as being the people who are going to like bring more cool stuff into the world. And that if I can pass a few tools on to help them make something cool too, then then that's worthwhile. That means that the things that I'm doing don't go to waste. I mean, it's not just about the work that I've made. It's how can I pass on what I've been learning throughout my career. If your life was a comic book or a movie, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? Oh, <laughs> well, I was actually toying with this after I did the Kickstarter and I was going to do the book launch. I had put together a little slideshow that I called Zen and the Art of Werewolves, <laughs> <laughs> which, uh, you know, I suppose if I were to ever write a memoir, that might be a what would the soundtrack be like? Well, my my literal sound, the soundtrack of my actual life is filled with like Irish and Scottish trad music because that's what I play. But I don't know if that would necessarily fit. Like I have playlists that kind of line up with the various phases of my life. So like there's like kind of like this, like these mixtapes that my friends gave me in high school that like I totally associate that stuff with what was going on when I was in high school. And it was things like... Metallica and R.E.M. and Joe Satriani, which is probably a guitarist you've never heard of, but he's still awesome. And then in college, it would be all things like Weezer and, you know, Green Day and stuff like that. And then getting on into like the early days when I was doing Paradigm Shift, it would be things like Radiohead and Depeche Mode and things like that. And these days I'm all over the place. <laughs> Well, Derek, I do hate to say, but that is this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me. And this has been great. I've had a really good time. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> this makes up for that last uh, non-interview that we had. <laughs> yes. I remember you called me an auteur and I, I that stuck with me. <laughs> oh, good. I'm, I'm glad my verbose uh, vocabulary worked out really well when I was trying to sound smarter than I was. I mean, it was like accurate. That's accurate. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? Of course, uh, your website, social medias, and everything like that. We can help see your amazing future that you've created so far. Well, thank you. I mean, most of my work, uh, you can find at paradigmshiftmanga.com. Intermittently, when I when I have things I like to share, I'm on Twitter at DirkTD. I'm on Instagram at DirkITD, which don't ask. <laughs> And please, if you'd like behind the scenes things, go to the website, sign up for my mailing list because I, I post extra things there. So especially behind the scenes stuff, because I like sharing process. That's one of my favorite things. Yeah, please come check it out. Like I said, that is this particular episode of Two Geeks Talk. You can, of course, find this interview and about 1,200 plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word two, T-O-W, not the number two. Uh, website's going through a revamp because I am only one person. Go to our YouTube channel, which is a lot more updated, which is youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. The podcast is back after 12 or so years as well, too, because other reasons, which is twogeekstalking.pod bean.com or just search for two geeks talking on your favorite audio podcast service and as i say every week everyone has a story to tell it's up to me to help bring that out thanks for listening watching on two geeks talking